Well, hello and welcome to the very first of hopefully many Wright County Restoration Project podcasts. My name is Jamin. I have with me Sam today, and we are going to be talking through what we're doing here, our vision for the podcast, what we'd like to see this be and become. And then, of course, with Thanksgiving coming up this week, we'll hope to have a little bit of time to uh, talk about the first Thanksgiving, as it were, uh, yes. as it is going. Yes, and yeah, the many misconceptions and and hopefully maybe set a few things right and give some food for thought. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's just take a, a minute and talk about what we're doing here, why we're mm-hmm. doing this. Uh, Wright County Restoration Project is an attempt for us to... Um, bring about within the the scope of Wright County a measure of cultural and spiritual restoration. Uh, We recognize today that uh, a lot of people aren't really learning a lot about history, and churches haven't done a real great job either of teaching what the Bible has to say. And as we look at where our our culture is today and where our society is, we see all of the, particularly in the headlines or the problems as it relate to politics, Mm -hmm. Um, but we would see that as kind of a uh, kind of a symptom more than a cause, right? And, and what we're actually looking toward is uh, trying to dig to the root causes of some of the problems we have today and uh, perhaps a lack of appreciation uh, in our culture and in our age for uh, history. Right. And what, where, what history is, what it means, and then also a lack of understanding of maybe where the Bible fits into these things. So... I'd like to begin, uh, for everybody that's listening today, to talk a little bit first about um, what we might call the three-legged stool of society and uh, consider the biblical basis. And then uh, I'll turn it over to you for a few minutes and we can talk a little bit about history. Sounds and good. Uh, then uh, when push comes to shove, we'll, we'll get down to a little bit of, uh, of the nitty-gritty of Thanksgiving. Sounds good. Uh, so as we look in the Bible... What we find is, is that we have various authority institutions, right? And one of those main institutions that we find in the Bible uh, is government. And that's an institution which there's a lot of debate about today. Uh, the role of government, how much government ought to, to have a say in our lives. And of course, we as Americans um, aren't big fans a lot of times of having the government say in our life. But that's changing right. in America. And that's an important Uh, thing for us to understand. And then the question we ask is, why? Why is that changing in America? Why have things changed? Why why do people want, encourage, uh, are are eager, perhaps even we might say, to have the government intervening in our lives? And I think what that comes down to is an erosion of the other institutions that we find in our culture. Mm. It seems as though government has elevated at the same time that uh, a couple of other very important institutions have been minimized. And we do see, of course, in Romans chapter 13, an important call to obey government, and that government is ordained of God, so we recognize the ordination of government. But well before the institution of government, we see the Bible speak to a man leaving his father and his mother and cleaving unto his wife, and those two becoming one flesh. And and there we see the institution of an institution, um, which we call the family. Right. And it seems as though that as the Bible designs it, uh, a society and a culture is really meant to be made up of many families and that the family was intended to be a, a pretty important part of of society and culture and the family has naturally within our culture eroded uh, for any number of reasons today mm-hmm. we see divorce rates uh, ever since really the advent especially of no-fault divorce uh, going through the roof we see um, family being defined in, in any number of different ways today and yeah. the redefinition of the family and Uh, And so we see a family having its erosion. And then we also seem to see an erosion of the church. And and we're not necessarily talking about an erosion of the ability for the church to have its say. It seems as though, at least as of uh, here in in 2020, um, the church still does have uh, the right to have a voice. And yet in some ways it seems as though it's given up its voice. Mm -hmm. It, it It is ceded to culture. Rather than influencing culture, it's allowed culture to influence it. And so we find ourselves in a unique place today where um, as as the church seems to be failing at getting across its message, 
and family seems to be failing at passing along these institutions from one generation to the next, uh, and these teachings from one generation to the next, we instead see, we kind of see government supplanting both of them. Yeah. Where now people don't run to their family for support or they don't go to their church for support when they have a health need or mm -hmm. when they have a, a, a financial crisis, they, they run to the government and the government becomes that safety net. And uh, people are clamoring for the government to be the, the arbiters of, of what is taught in schools. And of course, the government has done that for a number of years. And, uh, and so it seems as though we have the government really replacing mm -hmm. almost every institution uh, in our culture yeah. and and this has brought an imbalance naturally uh, and that's something that we want to correct with this podcast we want to change the way people think of of their in, of their their institutions not to take away the right that government has uh, as an Absolutely. authority but rather to keep government in its place and then give us a, a, a renewed appreciation rather than trusting the government schools to teach our children rather than trusting uh, church institutions that have largely ceded themselves to culture mm -hmm. uh, to teach our children, uh, for the families to take up the, the important role of, of education, Absolutely. Uh, for the church to take on its important role in guiding the people into the truth of the Word of God, and then hopefully that if culture could be restored to this degree, if Wright County could be restored in these ways, mm -hmm. um, then we could see uh, a, a renewed desire for, for government to... Stay in its lane, we might say, yeah. uh, as it relates to these things. And then for people to want government to stay in its lane and to look at the government and say, uh, thank you for your desire to help, but no thank you. Mm -hmm. We have other institutions in place to handle these things that you're offering to handle. And with these institutions being more closely connected to the people, perhaps, um, perhaps they'll be more effective in, yeah. in their intended goals. Yeah. So... We, we see this, and, and this is a desire for the podcast itself. Um, how does history play into this? History is, is really a, you know, it's, it's, it's accounts, it's firsthand information, it's retelling of what those who have gone before us have, have gone through and have, have invested in, have, have sacrificed for, so that we can sit here and enjoy um, really the fruits of their labor. And yeah. I think um, why history is important and why I think we've really hit on you know, these two parts, the, the, the spiritual restoration and the restoring of uh, an understanding of history, um, and I think those go really hand in hand yeah. to help us give a clear picture, help erase misunderstandings and myths that we have been mm. taught and ingrained into us by culture, by the media. And then also, hopefully, once those false thinkings and thought patterns are removed, then building a foundation of what truly the founders were all about, what um, those who have gone before us, um, why liberty was important, yeah. why... Um, a limited government is important. Why the church and the Bible is important. And I think all those things will become extremely clear when one has a really good grasp of history. And so I think that's, that's why I think history is such a crucial part of this restoration project is, you know, we, we need to, in a, in a big way, reorient our minds as far as what what really happened in our past. Right. And and we would see that not just about discounting or, or, or correcting the narrative as it would relate to perhaps um, that which a certain side is trying to push, but we don't want to push our own narrative either, right? Absolutely. One of the things that you want to do is is really stress original sources so mm -hmm. that we can go mm -hmm. back, we can read what 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 people saw, what people experienced, right. and then we can assess for ourselves. 
uh, what what we understand about it and 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 what we can pull from it rather than uh, just taking anyone else's word for it. And it's the same thing that we want to do with the Bible that we want to do with history, which is we want to read the Bible. We want to know what it actually says. And instead of uh, uh, just trying to discount their narrative or adding a narrative of our own, Mm -hmm. uh, we want to actually find out what happened, what happened in history, what happened in the Bible. And then we'll take those things and we'll draw from it um, those necessary and those Mm -hmm. adequate lessons in order to move forward. So that's, Absolutely. yeah, that, that, that's, uh, um, that'll be important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that I appreciate about what you've said in the past is we're, we're striving for balance here yeah. in how we're looking at history and, and in how we're looking at the word of God to, to, and, and of course there is going to be some of our, 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 our thought process and bias behind these things, but trying to be careful right. because you know, we've seen a lot of how the, you know, in culture, there's definitely a swing away from, you know, you know, what originally was taught to our grandparents, right. which was America's the best place ever. Exceptionalism and patriotism. Right. And mm-hmm. even further back, we look at things like Manifest Destiny and other things. Right. And there's been a huge swing back the other way where... Any Caucasian immigrants are are invaders and destroying a, a lovely, peaceful utopia that was here before. And and we'd like to come and say, hey, both sides had issues. Right. Let's lay out what the actual people there said, what they wrote, and then we can decide based on those things and and through good teachers and other information what actually happened and how we can understand and and benefit from a an understanding of what what has happened in the past yeah and this comes down to a a fundamental and and very important part of what we're doing here which is truth Mm -hmm. uh we've been we will stress this quite a bit both on the history side and on the bible side uh over well hopefully the life of the podcast (laughs) which is what we want we don't want narrative now we may use narratives in order to to make things interesting but we don't want narrative and there, there's even a place for narrative, but we, what we what we were really trying to do is is discern truth. What what actually happened? Mm-hmm. Uh, what actually mm-hmm. what does the Bible actually say? And and without truth, we're kind of sunk, right? Yeah. And this is a unique place that we find ourselves in in our culture, where truth has been put on the chopping block. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Not just not just certain truths as we look right. at history, which is very true, or certain truths as as we look at the Bible. Uh, but truth itself, the concept of truth has been put on the chopping bo- block so that we don't uh, even we – have, we have a culture that doesn't necessarily even believe that truth is a thing. Uh, it, truth is what I say it is. We talk about people saying th- that they have their truth right. or their lived experiences. And mm-hmm. really what we used to call those, we used to call those opinions, right? We used to call those experiences, things that, that we've experienced or things that we've seen – but not necessarily uh, meaning that this is a transcendent truth. And now people seem to say, well, there's no real such thing as transcendent truths. Yeah. It's only what I've experienced or it's only what I believe. And that's something that we want to kind of combat as well. Absolutely. Uh, and using the word of God and then allowing the word of God to be the foundation and then branching into various elements of history. Certainly, we're not going to elevate the narratives of, of history to the the level of the Word of God. Absolutely. But simultaneously recognizing in the Word of God the testimony that there is truth. And then it's our job, your job as a historian, to do your due diligence, to do as, as best you can to come to that truth. Right. And then admit right. where truth is not knowable or findable because of the limitations of the resources mm-hmm. that we have at hand. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you know, move on from there. For sure. Absolutely. Well, good. So we've talked a little bit about the expectation, but it is Thanksgiving yes. coming up here. Mm-hmm. And that because it's Thanksgiving coming up, um, let's talk a little bit about what we would characteristically call the first Thanksgiving. Right. Uh, that time right. in Plymouth mm-hmm. um, when our 
forefathers before we would even have considered them our forefathers right. uh, met and 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 the the struggles that they went through to get to the new world and some of these things and you've you found and and, and worked through some very interesting things as it mm-hmm. relates to history uh, and, and maybe introduce your source material a little bit and then tell us a little bit about this uh, this time there in Plymouth yeah for sure so um, like we said we're going to be using as much original sources as possible and so uh, the book I went to is of Plymouth Plantation. Uh, it's a written by William Bradford, mm. and it is William Bradford is the the second governor of the Plymouth Colony. The the first one uh, passes away in the first year or so. William Bradford is then governor for a very long chunk of time, and really is the 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 shepherd or the leader of that that small group, mm. and so. He, he writes in a very, and, and this, has, as old documents and things go, this one's a, a hard read. Hmm. I'll, I'll put that out there. He writes in very much an old English style. Um, these folks are, are living right at the time of the, the, the King James Bibles being written. They don't even have it yet. Hmm. Um, it's, it's very much that old, old sounding language. And so that's, uh, you know, I would absolutely encourage someone to read it if you can find it on audiobook or something, but it's definitely going to be a, be a, a, be a, a heavy book sure. to get through. But what you do find in it is a really interesting picture into a small group of, of dedicated believers hmm. who, for, for a very, very noble reasons, decide that where they are are you know where the book starts out with them in in England and and in this situation they find themselves in very in a very hostile environment to them worshiping God in the way that they see fit mm. um, and that's to us it's a little hard to, to grasp what this is actually like and and we live in a country where the state does not enforce the rules of the church right in any way shape or form which is a huge blessing right. but the the time in which the pilgrims lived and this is even into what we would know as elizabethan and then into the to to king james the, the time of England at this time. And, and if you look at it, that's not really a time that we think of a lot of persecution happening. Right. But it's still a time when the Church of England, the Anglican Church, is, is still enforcing, if you don't worship God in this certain way, if you don't use this certain prayer book, if you don't attend church so many times, there is actual capital punishment mm. that will be meted out to you and your family if you do not do these things. Wow. And so, and, and we're talking about getting thrown in the stocks. We're talking about losing limbs, branding. It, it was a very brutal, brutal time. Yeah. And so these folks come, come from that time. And, and just to write any pictures that you have in your head, um, we're not talking about people that dressed all in black. We're not talking about any buckles on their hats or anything. <laughs> we're, we're not... All of those pictures that we have and, and whatever you see in cartoons at, you know, at this time, that's all, that's all myth. That, that there's really... We're not even sure where some of those myths came from. Sure. Uh, these folks liked color. They, they dressed in color. Their, their clothing was... was you know, it was it was their period of their time, um, and they also the the pilgrims, as we call them today, were a group called separatists, and they are different from a group that they seem to get lumped in with a lot, which is the Puritans, mm. which is a much bigger group, almost a political party in their time, um, which had some good things and some flaws as well, and we'll talk about them later. We can't get into who the 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 Puritans were. They they were a different group, and they'll come up later. But the the separatists were this this group who, as I said before, were wanted to worship God the way they felt the Bible said God should be worshipped. And when the government church came in and said, "Hey, you got to worship God the way we tell you to," they weren't about to let that happen. Sure. Uh, so, so then these separatists, they, they left England, mm-hmm. and where'd they go? Okay, so you have this, um, 
in their area, the only real place that had what we would consider religious liberties um, was really Holland at mm. this time. Um, there were a few other places, but Holland mainly was. Now, it was it had liberty in a lot of different ways. Mm. Um, there was, and, and not all good. Sure. Um, there was definitely a lot of, you know, liberty to to sin and live your life the way you wanted to as well and and that was something that really graded on these very pious mm -hmm. folks as they came they it was a it was a new culture a new new vocation for many of these folks but mm. they uh and it was also a a hard place to to raise their families mm. but they took this um opportunity and and I would recommend, and, and we'll we'll post some links to maybe if you want to study more about the pilgrims, uh, maybe some good things to look up. Sure. But um, just their journey from England to uh, Holland was uh, kind of miraculous and and very harrowing as that was as well. But then in Holland they begin to try to build a new life, uh, try to build their own businesses and other things, yeah. and and. Um, and they're there for a number of years, and what they run into is um, the hearts of their children being led astray. Hmm. Uh, this was one of the biggest heartaches to these folks. Was they had they were trying to bring up their children in a in a, a good, pure environment, something we can relate to yeah. um, that we desire for our children to to walk uprightly, be good citizens, and and to to believe as we do and, and, or, or at least as, as, um, you know, believe the word of God and, yeah. and live in a Christian godly manner. And this was something that was, was very difficult to do in the, you know, very free, but also very sinful yeah. place in, in Holland. And that was why at that point they decide, and, and there's another political reason Spain and Holland had been at odds and that started to there started to be more um, alignment between those two countries and um, another historical subject the Spanish Inquisition mm. uh, was very much in the back of their minds this was vast persecution against anyone who did not believe the way the the Catholics at that time wanted them to believe and that's we'll, we'll get into that some other time and sure. and and hopefully that doesn't offend any of our Catholic listeners, but that was uh, an issue at that time. But we've talked about truth, right? right. And we're not right. here to whitewash anything that any particular religious group mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. political group has done. We're here to talk about what is true, what actually happened in history. Right. 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 And so that's, you know, and that was, that was something in the back of their mind as well. And so they decide through a, a number of things to travel to the new world. This would have been from from our standpoint, almost like going to another planet. Hmm. Um, the And the voyage wouldn't have been first class. This is very cramped quarters, very small area, about 102 persons head over in, you know, the Mayflower, as we know that, you know, that, right. that, that's something that is true, uh, that we have learned. Uh, the, the, the Mayflower was the ship they came over on. It was very, very small, mm. uh, very cramped quarters. And this group of, of, of pilgrims, uh, this group about, about half of this 120 or 102, sorry, 102 people were, um, of these, of these separatists. Yeah. And then the others were, other folks looking for a new a new life in the in the new world. So about half of them, about fifty percent, were of uh, these folks, and the others were um, other people that were looking for a new country. And so, and they were heading off into uncharted areas, um, even worse than they were actually expecting. Um, they were planning to go to Virginia, which already had some sort of colony there. Sure. But um, through storms and other things, they find themselves in what we now know as Cape Cod, Massachusetts, yeah. that Plymouth area. It wasn't and, an exact science getting from point A to point B. Right, right. It was stormy. It was just travel at that time was was horrible yeah. and they were willing to to risk basically everything hmm. uh, including their lives to find a place where they could 
to could live in and worship in the way they wanted to and bring up their families yep. in the way that they saw that the Bible laid out that they should. And so they, they come over and one of the issues that they instantly run into because they're in this Cape Cod area, there is no, there is no charter at this time. Mm. There is no law in this area when they get there. And there are definitely those a part of the, the group on the boat, not necessarily a part of the, the separatists, but others in the group that see this as a chance to get away from any semblance of law. Mm. Uh, there's no law. Basically, you know, utter anarchy. We can right. do whatever we want. As soon as we're off this boat, it's, it's whatever we want to do. And very wisely, uh, the leadership of the separatists and, and, and many others on board the, the Mayflower, before they ever set foot on land realized that there is law and order needed even in this this wild and, and new world. And so Absolutely. they put together the Mayflower Compact, which is a very simple document, and I would encourage you to read it. Uh, but it, it lays out basically just simple, very simple government, but they realized that they needed a, a law to, to be governed by. Law is important. Liberty is important. But balanced by law. You right. need both of those things. Otherwise, you wind up with chaos and anarchy. Well, and, and that idea of liberty and law has a very storied past. I mm -hmm. recall reading back in the days of, of Greece, particularly when Persia was coming in and attempting to encroach mm -hmm. upon Greece, uh, some of those early historians speaking of the Greeks, and, and they never spoke of the Greeks just loving liberty. They always said they love their liberty and their laws, mm -hmm. and that recognition uh, in, in what would be really the, the founding of Western culture in, in Greece, which is a recognition of this, this um, uh, a dual, uh, two pillars really that hold up the house, and one of them is liberty, but the other one is law, and that's a very important thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just to give you a little picture of who these folks were, um, kind of before we talk a little bit about the first Thanksgiving, the hardships they went through, you know, it's one of those things. And sometimes I'm sure, you know, in, if you're interested in survival and other things, you kind of think through, Hey, if I was stuck in such a place, if I got dropped out of an airplane over, you know, Canadian wilderness <laughs> or somewhere, what would I bring? What would I take with me? If I was with a small group of people, who would I have? All those kind of things. I think it, it's interesting to see what the pilgrims brought with them. Sure. And and they weren't as much, they weren't as different from us as we would think. Mm. Um, one of the things, you know, God's word was very important to them. Having that taught, having someone that could teach them God's word. That was definitely one of the key things they brought. The other one that might surprise you was they were very intent and very interested in learning how to use and to have good firearms. Hmm. Uh, firearms and not just uh, personal firearms, but larger things like cannons and those type of things. Those were something that they brought over. They not only brought over that each man needed to have his own firearms and equipment, sure. but they also brought over what in our time would be considered a former military, maybe a little bit like a spec ops type veteran that they brought over with them in Miles Standish. Mm. And he came over to train them rigorously in the use of the most modern firearms that they could get their hands on. Sure. At that time, it would have been matchlock muskets, but that they were... That though they were, you know, very pious people, they still realized the need for self-preservation, yep. the need for defending one's liberty, one's life and, and property in this, in this new world. And so mm. that was something that we see come up again and again. And they use these weapons not just to defend themselves um, against hostile natives in that area, which didn't happen really that much. Hmm. You actually see them going out and stopping other white settlers and traders that come in. This is later, many years after they've established, sure. and stopping these these people from coming in and abusing the native women, hmm. selling the natives alcohol and spirits, um, 
giving them you know bad deals and also they were very much against anyone selling the natives uh, guns and gunpowder sure. for Naturally. obvious reasons because you you lose your edge there. But so so this particular group then the, these uh, separatists that mm -hmm. came over the ones where we connect them to that first Thanksgiving right. had a very good relationship in fact with the natives that were already there and uh, not not the kind of hostility that we might think of weren't necessarily coming over to kick everyone out and enslave and rape and pillage or anything mm -hmm. of the sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's something we don't really have time to get into, but it was providential that God actually created an area where they land that the Native Americans didn't even really want that land. Hmm. It, there was a, a group of, uh, there was a, a tribe that had lived in that area that had all been wiped out by a plague. Hmm. And when they move in, it wasn't really anybody's land at that time. And even with that case, they still paid for it to the, to the local tribes, paid for the corn they took um, when, they, when they found it there, and then lived in very, very good peaceful relations with the native tribes around them up until what we know as the King Philip's War. Hmm. And so that's, that's several generations in. And so, but that's, that's, that's a very unique thing to the, pil the pilgrims and the folks there at Plymouth. Other groups that come in deal with a lot of hostility back and forth, sure. a lot of, um, you know, deceit and, and, and treachery and, and just, just bad relations altogether. So there's definitely groups that had that, but yeah. this was a very unique group in the way they handled relations with the natives. Now, would you connect that in any way as we think through this uh, pairing uh, in the restoration project of history and the Bible, would you connect it in any way to their faith that they were able to have this uniquely positive relationship as opposed to maybe some of these other settlements that perhaps were not did not have the same uh, expectation or the same goals set in mind as it related to why they were in the New World? Mm -hmm. I really think, um, as you said, I think you touched on something that's very key. And, and if you do take the time to read of Plymouth Plantation, um, you will definitely see that not only were the pilgrims very much, not just in name and in their, in their words, very Christian, mm. but in the way they lived, um, in the way they cared for those around them. They were very kind, compassionate people, and to the point of being taken advantage of themselves. Hmm. Um, the way they were able to come over to the New World was by use of some, some speculators, some, some wealthy men in, in England that said, hey, we'll pay for you guys to go over there, but we're going to ask that when you get there, you are going to export uh -huh. goods of this country. Yep. Um, they exported wood and furs and and other things. They tried salt. Uh, that didn't work out so well to, to export that. But they, they tried to export things. Um, and then the, the profits from that would go to these speculators. It was kind of an investment and sure. then they were going to get something back. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you read through this, it's, it takes them years to get out of this contract. And there's hmm. definitely changing of the rules, just these... And, and as as the businessmen that they were dealing with right. was very much, um, you know, they were very much being taken advantage of multiple times by multiple people. Yeah. And they, not saying that that was a, a you know, and they were, they, they it was new to them in business, but they were very much giving people the benefit of the doubt yep. and working in a way that they wanted to love people as themselves. I mm -hmm. think something that really touches on this, and and I'll just read a little bit from this um, uh, from this book, but it's very interesting to look at. Now, this is just a little window. When the pilgrims get to the New World, um, they show up in the middle of November. It's, it's mm. snowy, it's sleety, and just, just a miserable time to try to plant a colony in the New England area. Just, yep. just terrible time. And disease and sickness starts to just ravage their ranks. Mm. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a bit, but if you look at, this is very interesting, in, in Bradford's own writings, he talks about how the, the separatists treated the sailors 
the the hardened sailors that were on the Mayflower. Sure. And because they were dealing with the exact same thing, because they were just on a boat and these separatists had built little cabins and and huts and things to live on the land. But here's the so I'll just read a little bit and then I'll kind of explain it. It's a little hard hard English to understand, but I'll try to to work it out here. So um <clears throat> So, but now amongst his company, there were far another kind of carnage in this misery than among the passengers. For they that before had been boon companions in drinking and jollity in the time of their health and welfare, began now to desert one another in this calamity, saying they would not hazard their lives for them. Hmm. They should be in they should be infected by coming to help them in their cabins. And so after they came to lie by it would do little or nothing for them. But if they die, let them die. I'll kind of translate. So the men aboard ship are dealing with the same thing, but they're not really caring for each other. It's every sure. man for himself. If you're down, I'm not going to try to pick you back up. He goes on to talk about one man that was was begging one of the other men and saying, hey, I have a little bit of 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 monies or whatever that, you know, just please make me a little bit of food or whatever. He was so weak. And um, the guy did it, but then the guy was still alive the next day. And he was so, he said, hey, you've taken advantage of me. I thought you were going to be dead by uh-huh. now, which is, is terrible. And, terrible. And the sad thing about it is he, the guy did die the next day. Mm. But that they had, it was just this kind of dog-eat-dog, yeah. very hardened nature of these, these, you know, sailors. So here's just a little account of what the sailors saw in, in these separatists and how they treated them. Mm. Um, but such of the passengers as were yet aboard, so there were still some on board ship that were kind of in both places here okay. at this time, showed them what mercy they could, which made some of their hearts rent as the boatswain and some others, who was a proud young man and who often cursed and scoffed the passengers. But when he grew weak, they had compassion on him and helped him. And when he confessed he did not deserve it at their hands, he had abused them in word and in deed. Oh, saith he, you I now see show your love like Christians indeed, one to another. But we let one another die and lie like dogs. Hmm. So this was the one of those hardened sailors. And so the it's it's a very beautiful picture. It's It's not a perfect picture, but if you do get a chance to read of Plymouth Plantation by William Bradford, you're able to see this group of flawed Christians that live out their Christianity very clearly before the people of the world around them and, and like you said, in their relations with the native population, in their relations with um, other outsiders and, and non-believers, they truly show a love, a care, and even a... A, a love and care to the point of even letting themselves be taken advantage of hmm. for the betterment of others. Well, and this is what we would expect if they're reading the Bible, right? Because mm-hmm. Romans tells us as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. And we see the idea that, uh, you know, Jesus says, if a man take thy coat, let him have thy cloak mm-hmm. also. If he take, if he compel you to go a mile, go with him too. Uh, we even see in Acts chapter 17, uh, as there's this this uh, great sermon of Paul in Athens, he, mm-hmm. he's speaking to um, this group of people in Athens at, at this altar to the unknown God. Mm-hmm. He says that God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he need anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the time, but times before appointed and bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they may feel after him and find him, 
though he be not far from every one of us. So we see this idea that Paul states that all men are made of one blood. Mm -hmm. And so this concept that we have today, really, as we think about even race, mm -hmm. uh, we, we would call race a social construct, right? That right. there is no race but the human race, and we all have different shades of brown that our skin is entailed. Uh, but simultaneously, we, we recognize that that we are all made of one blood. And, and naturally, throughout time, various religions and various times, we've gotten this wrong. Right. And the, these were not perfect people as it relates Absolutely. to no Christian is a perfect person. But we do see that this, this common humanity, this respect for all men, this desire to live peaceably with all men, this, this uh, creed in the Christian uh, world to love one another mm -hmm. uh, did manifest itself quite uh, strongly in, in, their, in their colony. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and through this time, when they get to the New World, their metal is really tested hmm. in this. Um, by needing to to help one another in some of the hardest ways possible because of the sickness and and the hardship that they find, and this is is in contrast why a Thanksgiving was needed th that next year sure. to see God's goodness because um, one thing that most people don't realize is they lose fifty percent in three mm. months in the first three months in the New World. In the middle of winter, February, January, they lose 50% wow. of the group that comes over. 102 people around that, 102 people come over yeah. on the Mayflower. And of that, of that group, about 50 of them pass away wow. uh, due to sickness and due to hardship. And I think that's, that, that's just, you know, kind of a shocking number to yeah. our, our modern thinking. And, and one of the numbers that I think really hits home to me and that really is strikes at the heart of who these people were and why they came over was at how many of the original heads of household, but also of how many of the, the mothers of hmm. the families pass away in this group. Not many of the children pass away. Um, only 12 of the original 26 heads of families and four of the original uh, 12 attached, unattached men and boys were left. Of the women who reached Plymouth, all but a few died. Wow. And so you have these fathers and mothers um, giving, um, you know, this is more speculation. We don't have it in good documentation, but we can kind of assume from the way the numbers lay of how many passed away that the fathers and mothers were giving whether it was food or clothing or whatever in this cold very hard time yep. to their children to preserve them through this time and literally laying down their own lives yeah. for that next generation that would plant this colony in the new world mm. and that wow. the the ability to lay down one's life for for the uh, a, a better place to to worship God as they see fit, yep. to raise your children, was truly brought um, to light by just those first three to four months of the, the the separatists coming in and and just being decimated by sickness and disease mm. and starvation, and then coming through that that crucible, as it were to then you know be some 50 or so persons that would celebrate that first thanksgiving all all in this desire not not specifically to have religious liberty because they had that in holland right but to be able to live in an environment where they could not only be free but then also be able to preserve their ch i mean they 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 left holland for their children because right. their children were in this what we might call a libertarian yes, society so. where it was anything goes and as long as you're not hurting someone else but it was it was uh, deeply negatively affecting their mm -hmm. their children and mm -hmm. looking for that place where not just where they could have religious freedom but where their children could be preserved and that posterity could be preserved from generation to generation. So they they left for their children and then they died for their children Absolutely. in a very real way, mm -hmm. um, beginning a, a, a chain of sacrifices yes. that this country is really founded upon, mm -hmm. uh, much to the contrary of founding it upon colonialization, all these things, where really we, we see a, a foundation of, of, of the, the country being built upon love, 
right. and sacrifice. Absolutely. So we don't have a whole lot of time left. Let's talk about the first Thanksgiving. Yes. What can you tell us? Yes. So the first Thanksgiving, it's a time when um, they have they have planted and have have reaped a good harvest. Mm. Uh, they have worked through some interesting details and in figuring out how to um, have personal property be a good thing. Uh, that was an interesting thing. Right out of the gate, they realized, wait a minute, if if if, if it's a communal thing, it doesn't work very well mm. because then diligence isn't rewarded. So they made sure there was personal property, that they were able to have a, a good harvest of, of corn and were taught by the natives how to plant this corn in this new world. Because of this good relationship they had. Um, right, right. Mm -hmm. There was a good teaching, hand-holding relationship. They were able to to learn how to fish and how to hunt in this new world. And so at that next fall season, um, they have a, a, a Thanksgiving time, a time of Thanksgiving. Here's, here's what's written. There isn't a lot of really good documentation on what the first Thanksgiving really was all was. You know, in in writing, but here's here's kind of um, from from a Plymouth plantation uh, what is written about this. Um, they began now to gather in the small harvest they had, and to fit up their houses and dwellings against the winter, being all well recovered in health and strength, and had all things in good plenty. For as some were thus employed in affairs abroad, others were exercised in fishing about cod and bass and other fish fish which they took good store, of which every family had their portion. All the summer there was no want, and now began to come in store of fowl, as winter approached, of which this place did abound when they came first, but after decreased by degrees. And besides waterfowl, there were a great variety of wild turkeys, of which being, er, they took many, besides venison, besides they had about a peck of meal a week to a person, or now since harvest. Indian corn to that portion, which made many afterwards write so largely of their plenty here and their friends in, or to their friends in England, which were not feigned by their true reports. So you have this. Um, they have they have plenty. Mm -hmm. They they do diligence and hard work. They. They have enough. And so at this time, um, we, we see them um, invite the, the natives mm -hmm. to come and to feast with them. This is something that all cultures have had, you know, a, a time of plenty and, and a time of rejoicing. And they have um, religious services. They have uh, games of, of, of strength among the men, uh, running and and lifting and such various and competitions. All various competitions, um, accuracy competitions with firearms and uh, the Native Americans with their their bows and and such and so this was a time of, of fun so getting out and shooting on Thanksgiving is is very appropriate that's right and then um, also um, of, of feasting on 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 wild wild turkey it says here and of venison um, mm. that those are things that they had in abundance and so it was a time to be thankful, but how rich is that Thanksgiving when you think of, you know, to them, it's it's a bittersweet thing. Certainly. It's thinking about all of those that have passed mm -hmm. um, to, to get them to this point, um, how much life had been lost up to this point. Fifty percent of that group had been lost, and, and in the future, many more would die. They still, it, it takes several years, um, one of the big... Um, things that happens right after they have this Thanksgiving feast is another shipload of of pilgrims, as it were, show up, mm. and they show up without any food. Mm, wow. And so this is you know what happens after that you don't see is that they then have to divide everything that they just thought they had enough of with this group that comes over, which they're glad to see many friends and, and old faces, but. Um, now we've got to divide everything right. with this new group of people, and so that and that happens multiple times where these people come over, they don't have provision, and and then they are looked to to help provision these people, and then part of the misunderstanding and and sad things that happen is 
the the speculators, the people that are sending these people over, don't understand and say, hey, you guys are lazy. You're not really producing that much. Sure. And from the Pilgrim's perspective, we're trying to just feed and keep alive and and settle all these people that you keep sending over. So it's, it's an interesting situation. Um, and there's a lot of nuance that goes on. But it is this time that we celebrate as Thanksgiving. But it's something that I think it's good to remember and remember those who have gone before, like the pilgrims, and and we can think of others, even in our in our family's history mm. of of men, women who have laid down their lives in various wars, in various um, times of need, that have put their own lives at risk or their lives on the line to to give us the freedom to to assemble, mm-hmm. uh, the freedom to worship as we see fit to have the freedom to speak um, and to carry firearms. Sure. And so those are all things that we can look back and even as early as as the pilgrims was something that we can um, remember and have this as not just a day of, of fun and football and whatever, but as a day of remembrance for mm-hmm. those who have gone before us. Yeah, and really appre- appreciating that legacy. And this is one of the tragedies that, that we would desire to perhaps undo a little bit in yeah. our common culture, that uh, we live in a culture that desires there to be the perpetual present, but yes. kind of forgets the ground that groundwork that was laid for what we enjoy today. Absolutely. And it's essential, whether it's uh, to understand the groundwork that was laid in the Word of God for the principles by which these, these separatists and pilgrims operated, or to understand the, 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 the um, sacrifices that they, the pilgrims made, mm-hmm. and not mm-hmm. just made of their own group, but then to sacrifice of their plenty for the next group that came yes. to build up something more, or as you mentioned, those wars, or, or, or even perhaps for, for many listeners, it gets closer to home as maybe uh, their grandparents or, or great-grandparents uh, sacrificed everything to come here to this country and, and, and to start over again. And they worked hard and they made no money so that their children might be able to be established. And then the next generation perhaps was able to go to college and just that building. Mm-hmm. And, and that brings us to this recognition of opportunity. Yes, And it's where there is liberty and laws that then there is opportunity for thriving. And it is as we, we drift from the, the reality of truth mm-hmm. and then the, the presence of those fundamental truths that we begin to forget uh, that we need these laws and we need these liberties and, and that these liberties are founded in the principles of the word of God by which we operate. Mm-hmm. And, and so that thus Thanksgiving has become in, in our culture in some ways, well, some ways forgotten because in many ways it's it's really is a Christian holiday. Absolutely. As we think to this concept that we are thankful to God for his provisions, but we're also thankful for the legacy of uh, the Judeo-Christian culture that built the West, that laid the foundation of liberty and law, and we'll perhaps talk about that in the weeks to come and how liberty and law was developed in Western culture in order to bring these people with a mindset to a place mm-hmm. where they were ready to establish something that was not just new, but something that was almost entirely unique in history. Right. And never seen before yeah. in, in all of history as far as we can tell. Well, very good. Um, we, we've probably gone well beyond the time that we're supposed to <laughs> for today. But uh, I think that this first uh, first attempt at the Wright County Restoration Project podcast, mm-hmm. uh, I, I hope we can put the stamp of success on it for this time yeah. around. And uh, next time we'll we'll continue thinking through some of the elements of of uh, of the Bible and of history, and um, continue learning how they interact one with another and how we can use this history, the the Word of God, and these understanding to help rebuild our community and make it something that uh, not just we can enjoy, but maybe through a little bit of our own sacrifice, uh, leave something better uh, for the next generation. Absolutely. Okay. Well, then with that, we'll be back next time. Thank you for listening, for those of you that have, and uh, we'll look forward to doing this again. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving.